I would say, don't mess with the gospel. And uh, we have uh, studied the first chapter so far, and we are now at chapter 2 of Galatians, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. And my title this morning is Paul's Message Confirmed. Paul had a message that he got directly from God. This message, he did not, he made it, has made it clear, he didn't get it from anybody else, just directly from God. But there are people who do not like Paul's message. People who are calling Paul's message into question. And at this time, Paul receives a revelation from God that he should go and consult with the uh, apostles in Jerusalem just to make sure that his message is right on the money. So Paul is willing to do that. He is willing to submit his message to the apostles' scrutiny. And that is what happens in this chapter. So far, Paul has given us the part of his testimony that points out that he received the gospel from God, not from men. That's chapter 1, verse 11 to 24. As he continues his testimony, he makes the point that the gospel which God had revealed to him was no different than the gospel that the other apostles preached. In other words, and this is very important, there is only one gospel. There is only one gospel. And I want to invite you to read with me uh, Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 to, uh, sorry, verses 1 to 10. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Fourteen years later, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I, I went in response to a revelation and set before the, them the gospel that I preached al among the Gentiles. But I did this privately to those who seemed to be <laughs> leaders for fear that I was running or had run my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false brothers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in, Jesus, or in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might remain in you. As, as for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not judge by external appearance. Those men added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter had, had been to the Jews. For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. When we recognize when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. And they also, uh, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. In these verses, I want, I want to make three major observations. The first observation that I want us to see is in verses 1 to 3. Paul reported that there was a special meeting. Now this special meeting was not a public meeting, so not everybody would have known about it. But Paul is reporting to the people in, Gal in the Galatian churches that there was a special meeting. This meeting was between Paul and the 12 apostles who were in Jerusalem. He reported the when of 
this meeting, when this meeting took place. He says he went to Jerusalem, and the key words are, 14 years later. Now, some people like to uh, debate these uh, few words, the 14 years later, because they say, after what? Was it after Paul's conversion? Or was it after Paul's previous visit? My opinion is that since uh, he was simply talking about his previous visit in, verse, in, in the part of chapter 1 that we just went through, I think it was his previous visit. Some people argue that I know it was his conversion. Uh, either way, you're not talking about very much time difference. So he went up to Jerusalem 14 years later, and uh, then he tells us the who. First of all, the when, then the who. He took, the, uh, he took with him to the meeting, verse 1b. He took Barnabas. Barnabas was his companion. Barnabas was his encouragement. Barnabas was his strength. And so Paul took Barnabas along with him according to Acts 13, verse 2. But Paul also took Titus with him. Who is Titus? If you look at Titus chapter 1, verse 4, Titus is Paul's son in the faith. Paul, uh, Paul had gone and been a missionary, and he had had several people who had become believers through his mission work. Titus was one of these people and Titus was a Greek person. He was not a Jew. Titus was a Greek, or in other words, a Gentile. And Titus was, how can we say it? Example A of the fact that Gentiles could in fact put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So Paul took Titus along with him. So we have when, 14 years later, the time of the meeting, we have who Paul took with him to the meeting. Now we, we have a report in verse 2 of the why he went to Jerusalem for the meeting. He went in response to a revelation from God. Paul has been accused of being a false apostle. But what was required for someone to be an apostle? In order to be an apostle, you had to have a, a personal meeting with Jesus Christ. And guess what? Paul had a personal meeting with Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road. And as an apostle, God gave specific, direct times when God would direct uh, him as an apostle. God would speak to him and tell him where to go and what to do. And Paul says, he doesn't add much to it, he says, I received the revelation. Now some people say, was this revelation from men or from God? Well, Paul doesn't actually say, but the type of revelation, that it, the word, type of word that is used in this text is talking about a revelation that comes from God. So Paul receives information from God that he should go, that because there were people opposing him and his message of faith in Christ Jesus, he should go to Jerusalem and settle the matter. So Paul went to the meeting in response to the revelation from God. Secondly, he went to the meeting to explain his message to the apostles. The apostles were considered by the church to be the main leaders of the church. And as in our churches today, sometimes people get mixed up about leadership. Let me explain. Sometimes we think that leaders should be on a pedestal. Oh, they should be really super, super saints. And the fact is that Paul didn't buy this notion. A, a pastor or a church leader should be honorable, but there is no such way in that a pastor or a leader should be held on a higher level 
than anybody else. We are all servants of Christ. Every one of us in the body of Christ is a servant of Christ. We are all ministers of the gospel together. That's why the pastor should not be the only one sharing the gospel. All the people in the church should be sharing the gospel together. It should not be only the pastor. So Paul wants to make this very clear, that there's not a special distinction of, of some people. Get, get it out of your mind that some people are on a pedestal. Because if you put people on a pedestal, the pedestal's going to break at one point or another. Get them off the pedestal. Let's talk Turkey. And he went, and he wasn't going to put the apostles on the pedestal. He was an apostle too. And he went to, to explain his message to the apostles, and he did this privately. I think that was helpful. He wasn't arguing his message in front of the whole church. He was doing this privately. Secondly, he did it with the leadership. He wanted the leadership to be informed of what he was doing, and he wanted the leadership to uh, see, see that there was nothing he was hiding. And he did this to confirm his ministry. He didn't want to have the sense that in some way he was running the race for nothing. Or that some way he had done something which was useless. So, Paul gives us the when of the meeting, 14 years later. The who, Barnabas and Titus, he took with him. And the why of the meeting, because of a revelation, and to explain his message to the apostles. Then he gives a report in verse 3 of what happened at the meeting. And actually it's what did not happen. What did not happen at the meeting is that 12 apostles did not compel his Greek new believer, uh, item A, uh, you know, illustration A, they did not compel Titus to be circumcised. Now, if the Judaizers had been right, if the Judaizers' argument was right, they said you needed to be circumcised and obey the laws of Moses in order to become a Christian. If the apostles agreed with the Judaizers, Paul would have been, uh, had brought Titus with him, Paul would have, or the apostles would have said to Paul, you need to get this guy circumcised. You need to teach this guy to obey the laws of Moses. But Paul says, they didn't do that. And as a result of the fact that they didn't do that, I know that they were validating, they were putting their stamp of approval and agreement on the message that I was teaching. Now, I didn't get the message from them, but they agreed with the message that I had received from God. So, this is a powerful lesson that I think we should learn. person over here receives a message from God. And you say, how do you know if God really spoke to you or if it's a, your own idea? Good question. Person over here receives a message from God. Apostle Paul, for example. People over here, the leaders of the church, had received a message from God. They had been with Jesus for three years, and they had received the message of the gospel from Jesus himself, just like Paul had received the message from Jesus himself. Now, the fact was that Paul hadn't received it through the apostles. He had received it independently. You bring these two groups together, and if their message agrees, then guess what? You know that God has really spoken to Paul, and God has really spoken to the apostles, because their message is perfectly in sync. Now, if they hadn't agreed, then they would have had to scratch their heads and say, where did we, we miss the message?
message of God. Where did we not understand it correctly? So, that was Paul's report about the special meeting they, they experienced in Jerusalem. The second observation I want to make this morning is that Paul explained the reason for the special meeting. Verse 4 and 5. There was a specific issue that needed to be addressed. And what was it? False brothers had come into the ranks of the church. Now listen to me carefully. The church doesn't improve by having more people come. Do you hear what I said? The church doesn't improve by having more people come. You can have people come into the church who do not believe in Jesus. And if there ever comes a time when there are more people in the church who do not believe in Jesus than people who do believe in Jesus, you have weakened your church, not strengthened your church. These false brothers had influ influenced and infiltrated the ranks of the church. And they wanted to move the church off the main message of the gospel and into a message of works. Into a message of, of uh, earning your way of salvation. And if they had been successful in doing it, the church would have been harmed by its growth. That's why I don't say, bring everybody you want to have come to our church. Why don't I say that? Because first of all, you need to talk to them personally and try to lead them to the Lord. Because the church is the gathering place of believers. Are non-Christians welcome? Yes. Should they ever become the majority? No. Because if they become the majority, they weaken the church. These false brothers had infiltrated our ranks. He said they had a motive. They wanted to spy on the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. In other words, they had a devious purpose. You say, well, I don't quite agree with you, Pastor Tim. You're, you're kind of going the wrong way here with this application. Well, let me give you one illustration. I was in Steinbach, Manitoba, Canada. And I was a pastor of a church there that supported a Bible school. In that Bible school, they wanted to have uh, a new secretary. So they put ads out for a new secretary. As they put the ads out for the new secretary, they also said that the, that the new secretary had to agree with the, with the statement of faith of the Bible school. When a person was applied and was interviewed for that position, this person lied about their faith statement. This person was a Mormon, and because she lied about her faith statement, she was accepted as a Christian, and she was hired as the secretary of the school. After she was hired, the truth came out that she was a Mormon and that she wanna, wanted to get Mormon teachers into the Bible school. And we had a conflict on our hands. And to, to, to work in such a gracious way as to get that Mormon secretary out of her job because she lied on her application without looking to the government like we were uh, not giving right, her the rights she deserved was a very extremely complicated matter. Don't be fooled. There are people today who want to infiltrate the ranks of churches and Bible schools and introduce <coughs> false theology 
for their own purposes. What we need to do is we need to win people to Christ and train them to follow Christ's way and not submit to these people who want to infiltrate our ranks to teach false teaching. He said they want to spy on the freedom we have in Christ. They want to make us slaves to their own regulations. Paul says that's not acceptable. So not only was there a specific issue, but there was a strategic response. What did we do as a response to their, uh, their trying to infiltrate us? Paul says we did not give in for, for a moment. I didn't want to give in and say, okay, whatever, you can have your opinion, I can have my opinion, whatever, we'll just be nice to be together. Paul says we did not give in for one moment. We wanted the truth of the gospel to remain in you. In other words, the new believers in the Galatian churches. We wanted the truth to stay important and primary to you. Therefore, we didn't give in to false teaching. We stood for false teaching and did not compromise. And I believe we need to do the same today. Thirdly, I want to observe that Paul outlined the results of this special me meeting, verses 6 to 10. The leadership, Paul says in verse 6, added nothing to Paul's message. There is only one message. There is only one gospel. There is only one good news. The good news is, and I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again, Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again on the third day, so we could be forgiven. That's the message. The leadership approved of the message. They added nothing to it and took nothing from it. The leadership also recognized that even though that is the true message, they recognized that there were two special ministries going on in the church. What were these ministries? There was Peter's ministry and there was Paul's ministry. There are examples of the leaders uh, uh, as the leaders of, of these two ministries. First of all, Peter was the apostle to who? To the Jewish people. At Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Who spoke up? It was Peter. Who was he speaking to? The Jewish people who had come from all over the world had come to Jerusalem. Now Peter was preaching the gospel to the Jews. The same gospel as Paul preached, but he was emphasizing the gospel to the Jews. And if you look carefully at the whole uh, book of Acts, you will find out that Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 12, the main character in, in the teaching of Luke about, about what happened during the Acts of the Apostles, the main character is Peter. And he also was accompanied by John, but the main character is Peter. But now the re leadership of the church in Jerusalem is recognizing that there is another apostle who is going to shine, who is going to lead. And this is the apostle Paul. And he is going to preach to the Gentiles, and he would became the apostle to the Gentiles. It's a different ministry. Peter's main ministry was to the Jews. Paul's main ministry was to the Gentiles. And if you look at an outline of the book of Acts, Acts, uh, Luke ch tells us in Acts for chapter 13 all the way through 28 that the main leader of the Gentile push was the Apostle Paul. In other words, we can have one, one message and multiple ministries. One body, many gifts. So somebody might have a ministry to 
recovering alcoholics. Somebody might have a ministry to senior ladies. Somebody might have a ministry to uh, various other aspects of the church, to the Christian education program of the church. There are many ministries, but one gospel. Paul had a ministry to the Gentiles. Peter had a ministry to the Jews. Some of you might be able to win uh, Filipinos better than others. Some of you might be able to minister to Canadians better than others. Some of you might be able to minister to Spanish-speaking people better than others because you know the language better than I do. And God wants all of us to work together one message for many ministries to spread out and minister to many different people in our society. But I want you to notice verse 9. Just because there were different ministries doesn't mean that you can't fellowship together. The leadership recognized the grace that was given to Paul and Barnabas and they extended to them what? The right hand of fellowship. In other words, the leadership welcomed them warmly. And I thank Eileen for putting on the cover of our bulletin, the, the picture that she gave about extending the right hand of fellowship. What should a church be like? I'll tell you my vision for what Baptist Temple could be. Baptist Temple could be a church that has Hmong believers, because we have a lot of Hmong people in this community. Baptist Temple could be a church that has uh, African American believers, because we have a lot of African Americans in our community. Baptist Temple could be a church that has Spanish believers, because we have a lot of Spanish people in our community. Baptist Temple could have many ministries, but have the right hand of, of fellowship extended to every kind of ministry because we have the same message, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what happened in the early church. Varied ministries do not divide, need not divide since our message is the same. The leadership agreed to this strategy, the last part of verse 9. Paul and Barnabas will go to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John will go to the Jews. And then the leadership asked for one favor. What was that favor? that the poor be remembered. And this has a significant context. Because when you read the book of Acts carefully, you find out that there was a poor church. And where was the poor church? The poor church was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been the big church. Jerusalem had been the church that had spread people all over the world sharing the gospel. Remember in the early, book, uh, early part of the book of Acts? They had 3,000 people saved. They had 2,000 people saved after that. They were a huge, big church. But then they sent these people out to their home areas into their special ministries and churches multiplied around the whole area. And guess what happened? The church in Jerusalem shrunk. And the church in Jerusalem became poor. And the church in Jerusalem was needy. The church that had sp helped sponsor all this growth was a church that was in need. By the way, that could be the history of Baptist Temple. Do you know that Baptist Temple started at least 15 churches in our area? And people from Baptist Temple have gone all over. But right now, Baptist Temple 
is a smaller, poorer church than it used to be. And guess what? What was stated right here was that what you do to the apostles sent to the Gentiles, you tell them to please remember the original church. Please remember the church in Jerusalem. They are the poor. And Paul made it, made it an effort in many of his mission trips to ask the churches to give offerings to the Jerusalem church to help it keep on going. And he said, I was glad to do exactly what they requested me to do. To help the poor in their need. So what do you see? You see the spreading of the gospel. The willingness to have one message and different methods and different, and different ministries. But at the same time, the willingness of these new uh, <clears throat> vibrant works to support and love the older struggling works. I have, I have a comment to make, and this might sound a little bit political, but it's a comment that just comes right out of me reading the text. I wish our association would do this. I wish our association would see the churches that, that were involved in spreading and planting churches and now are struggling and would help them out. And that the richer churches in the association could share with the poorer churches in the association. I wish we could do that. But even though I don't see it happening in our association, I do see it happening in our city. There's a church, and I'm going to name it, Big Valley Grace, that has been extremely gracious to our church. Do you know that Billy, Big Valley Grace supplies between a quarter and a half of the food that we give away on Food Ministry Day? And we don't pay for that food. Big Valley Grace gives us the food. I know they're not in our association, but they're gracious to us. Do you know that Big Valley Grace, when we needed a furnace, air conditioner in our West Wing, they paid for half of our furnace, air conditioner? A gift of $4,000? They've been gracious to us. Why? Because they are a big, wealthy church on the other side of town. And they had Christian love. And they gave of themselves to help a smaller, struggling church. That's what talk, they're talking about here. He's talking about having the love of Christ in our hearts. And they asked us, that we should continue to remember the poor, and that was the very thing I was eager to do. And Billy, uh, sorry, Big Valley Grace has shown us that example right here in Modesto. What is the secret to unity in a growing church? We must realize that we have many ministries each one is important to reach people, but there is only one gospel, and that one gospel, that one good news, is sufficient, is enough to reach all people. It might need to be said in another language, but it's still the gospel. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you so much for what we can read from your word here in the letter of Paul to the Galatian church. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't give one message to Paul and another message to Peter. 
you gave only one message. But at the same time, I want to thank you, Lord, that you didn't give only one method and said everybody has to be a cookie cutter and come the same style of worship service, the same uh, language, the same ministry. But you said that there could be different kinds of ways to reach out to different kinds of people with the same message. Lord, help us as a church family to be imaginative in the way we reach out. To reach out in multiple ways so that we can reach many people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is only one message. But help us to use many methods to, to communicate that one message. And may it come clear to the people in our community